we want to study is what is a man and I have slash woman the reason for that is in the beginning when God created Adam we, we don't want to miss this but when God created Adam Eve was inside of him which is why in the creative this is terrible I don't know what the new ones are <laughs> That's why in the scriptures, it, when God is mentioning the creation of them, he speaks about it in the plural. When dominion is given, for instance, it's given to them, not just to Adam. The woman received the same blessing, the same authority, dominion, as the man. And by the way, Adam and Eve are not really personal names. They become personal names. This means just the man, and this means the mother of all living, basically. But now they become Adam and Eve. But there's something important here. Uh, men and women are comprised of a mind, a spirit, and a body. And the mind is what we want to focus on today. This is really, really important. Because there's a phrase in the scriptures, we're going to read it here, in Genesis 1, 26, 27. There's a phrase in that course of scripture that causes a lot of consternation and confusion. A lot of people don't understand what it really means. Let's read the scripture. God said, let us make man, Adam, in our image after our likeness. God created man in his own image. In God's image, he created him male and female. He created them. So we know that men and women are created in whose image? God's. God's image. Now, pay attention. <clears throat> pay attention. God said that the male and the female are both made in what? God's, God's image. image. God as spirit is not male nor female. <laughs> But God has, if you will, and we've talked about this before, uh -huh. both characteristics in God. We use He because God's greatest manifestation to us was and is Jesus Christ, who happened to be a male, Isaiah 9 <coughs> 6. So we use that frequently when we're talking about God. But God is spirit, and spirit, God made him male and female in God's image and likeness. And that's what we want to zero in on. I should have added this to it. It was God's image and likeness. And what we want to discover is what does this mean? Image and likeness. That's, that's the thing that I think confuses people. The following scripture tells us, forgive me for letting this slide here. The following scripture tells us that the man in the creation story was not a man. Now this is going to be fundamental. What we're, what we're about to study. It tells us he was not a man, but he is the man. Now follow, follow with me on this in the creation story. He and the woman inside of him were unique, a first of their kind. This is critical in understanding who we are and what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. The very fact that in the Hebrew, not in the English translations, it misses it, but in the Hebrew text, let's read on, in the Hebrew text, we'll find that the word the man is in, in there specifically for a reason. Verse 7, Genesis 2. <clears throat> Yahweh God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Here's Young's literal translation of that passage. And God formeth the man, dust from the ground, and breatheth into his nostrils breath of life, and the man becometh a living creature. The highlighted word there, the, in the Hebrew text is ha. That's how it would be sounded, I think. I don't speak Hebrew. But it would be ha. <coughs> is the equivalent of the word in our English language, the. Just stay with me, it's all going to come together. 
This tells the reader that this is the man, not a man. There's something unique about the man. The subtlety is absent in the English translation. The, telling the reader that this is the man. This, I'm sorry, the subtlety is absent in the English translation. And using the words the man, the reader is rightly led to understand the man was the first of a new kind, new species created by God. Take a minute, because I'm, I'm going to prove this in the New Testament. Wrap your head around this. Adam and Eve were the first of their kind, according to Scripture. There was nothing, no one ever made like them before. In saying that, I'm not saying that there weren't humans on planet Earth before them. That's quite possible. We have archaeological records, and you know, uh, science is telling us they discovered bones and artifacts from people living in caves. In fact, we know that for around 200,000 years there were humans that, was, that were on planet Earth. Now, this is important. Something happened, I believe, I would call it an extinction event, like the Great Flood wiped everything out. I think something's happened like that on this planet a couple of times before Adam and Eve were created. I don't have time to go into it today, but I think I have in one of your lessons. When God shows up to create, and it says that the Spirit of God hovering over the earth, and at the, at the time, it uses two Hebrew words. One has to do with void, the earth was void. The earth existed already, by the way. In Genesis, it doesn't say God created the heavens and the earth at that moment, it says in the beginning. We don't know when that moment was. But when God shows up on earth at this time to create the man, the new species of humans, in his image and likeness, there's something powerful in all of this, what's going on. God is seeding planet earth with a new creature. And every time you look in the mirror, you're looking at that new creature. It's amazing, staggering. And yet, few of us understand this and, and grasp the concept of who and what we were made to be in the likeness, the image and likeness of God. When God shows up on planet earth, the Spirit says it's hovering over it. And in the Hebrew, it says the earth was void and chaotic. Something happened. And so God repopulates the earth, I believe, with this new man. The man. It's a new creature, a new creation. I'm going to have to have somebody keep track of this for me. There we go. Now, let's, let's continue. The Apostle Paul, a Hebrew, writing thousands of years later, understood this when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 47, the first man is of the earth. Now he's referring back to Adam and Eve. The first man is of the earth. In this passage, the word first is protos. Does that sound like any word today that we have in English? Protos? Prototype. Prototype. What is a prototype? A prototype. Protos. Whoops. T-O-S. Is a first of its kind. Am I right or wrong? Uh -huh. A prototype is something that's never existed before. If you're an engineer and you make a prototype, you've created something new. This is the first of a new kind of something. And that's what the man was. He was the first of a kind, a new species, created how? In the image and likeness of God. Uh -huh. In the mirror. We'll get to the, I've got this in your notes. It says that he beholds his natural face, and when he turns away from that mirror, he forgets who he, who he was. It's in the past tense, was. The mirror there that Paul's referring to are the scriptures. When you look into the scriptures, you discover who you are, you see your natural face. The word in the, in the uh, let me, there it is. The word in the Greek there for natural face is Genesis. Huh. When you look into the scriptures, you will discover your Genesis face. You will discover 
your Genesis ident identity. But he also goes on to say that most of us, when we turn away from the mirror, the scriptures, we quickly forget what we just saw, mm -hmm. who we are. We're not just humans. We're men and women created in the image and likeness of God. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're a sinner or a saint. All of us are made in the image and likeness of God. We trace our genealogy back to Adam and Eve. All of us. And they were the man, the prototype, the first of a kind, a new species created in the image and likeness of God. Now the question is, what does that mean? Let's continue here with, with my point, though, in the Greek. The word protos means first in time or place. That would have been the Garden of Eden for us. The time would have been at the moment of their creation. In any succession of things or persons, first in rank, influence, <coughs> honor, chief, principle, first, at first. Somebody's going to have to keep this going for me. Can I give this to somebody so it doesn't go dark? Uh -huh. Thank you. Cause I've got my, well, I'm sorry. No. I've got my notes here, but I want to make sure you, you guys can read it. Anyway, strong. Uh, Paul understood the man in the creation of God was the first of his kind. The word translated man is anthropos. It means man face or human being. Certain man. This passage and others reveal Paul's understanding that the creation of the man was a first of a new species, a new type of being. That had never existed before. I believe there were humans, if you will, on the planet before. But I don't believe. Can I get that off? Oh, just. Get that little. Um, yeah. Thing black. Black. Oh, black. Okay. Yeah. So now Thank the question you. is what makes us unique? I'll give you a little hint. We know historically that humans. A particular kind of human called Homo erectus. Erectus means upright. That's all it means. And then we had, following Homo erectus, we had Homo sapien. It means someone who's aware, a, a person that has some knowledge. We know, we believe, I should say, that they lived for about 200,000 years on the planet. Recorded history is only about 7,000 years. We, we know that. Recorded history is the time when men and women began to write down what was going on around about them. Sometimes they did it with hieroglyphs and pictographs and so forth. Now, for about 2,000 years, humans were living in caves. Now think about that. Because in 7,000 years, a period of recorded history, we not only left the caves, we've gone to the moon and back. Something was missing here. Something's missing in this 200,000 year period. Whatever humans were here, they didn't have the image and likeness of God. That's what was missing. You're going to find out what that is today. But that's what was missing. When God does the new creation, about, I believe the new creation is about 7,000 years old. Humankind made in the image and likeness of God. Not humankind all, all throughout history. We know they've been here before. But not like us. Because we, in 7,000 years, 6, 7,000 years, have not only gone to the moon and back, we've created a digital world today. We're sending images through the air. Videos, photographs, text messages, TV. My television right now, what you're seeing up here, you know, you've got it. I know. I, I can't figure out how to get it. My out. television is picking up a signal. There. Let me get this down here. <clears throat> Try that. Okay. And just gently move it. Yeah. It's sending the signal from my tablet to my television wirelessly. <laughs> we, as a species, first of all, imagined it. Marconi was one of them. 
So we thought he could send a wireless signal across the Atlantic Ocean, I believe it was. He just imagined that and then <clears throat> created it. Edison thought about a light bulb. First, he thought about it first, and then he found a way to create it. This has to do with something unique that happened about 7,000 years ago. I think it was when the man and woman were first created. This new species came into existence. And what is it that they had that made them so special? Let's read on. <clears throat> For we can assume that God's image and likeness was unique, also a first of kind on the planet Earth. So this leads us to ask, what was God's image and likeness? How is it that we are like God? First, we know it cannot refer to any physical attribute of the man as God in his spirit. So it, God can't look like men. God doesn't look like women. God doesn't look human. That's not what makes us like God. So if we put up here the physical attributes, we can immediately determine that that can't be like God. Besides, we know God isn't going to die, right? Okay. Well, we know that the physical body is going to die. So that can't be what makes us like God. It just can't be. Let's continue. Strictly speaking, God as spirit does not possess physical attributes, hands and feet. Therefore, the man's physical attributes could not be God's image or likeness. Another fact to consider is the physical form of the man. His body was lifeless, just dust until God breathes into it. And then the man becomes a living soul. And by the way, in the Old Testament, we don't have a soul. We are souls. It's, it's really interesting. It says he became a living soul. Wow, that's kind of cool. So the physical body could not be the image and likeness of God as God was never lifeless. The question remains, what did they possess that made them like God? Some believe humans have souls and animals do not. Therefore, the soul made them like God. So we have that question. Is it the soul that makes them like God? Well, let's find out. In Genesis 2, 7, Yahweh God formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, nephesh. Now, I put the word, the Hebrew word in there for a reason. The scriptures tell us that animals are also souls. Hmm, that's interesting. We know God didn't make animals in his image and likeness. Did he? Mm -mm. No. So now we know, not the soul, let's read it. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and whosoever, whatsoever Adam called every living creature, <coughs> nephesh. What's that word nephesh mean in Genesis 2 7? How was it translated? Soul. Soul. Adam called every living creature, nephesh, that was the name thereof. So animals have. Are our souls too. Right? Mm -hmm. So God is, the image and likeness of God it can't be the physical, cannot be the soul. Let's go on. If animals are souls, as are humans, then the soul does not make the man like God. Others believe it is the spirit that makes us like God. And this is going to be, we've got to pay attention here. In the Hebrew Bible, the word for spirit is ruah, or U A H. That's a really bad R. Uh, just forget my writing and have to deal with it. That word Hebrew could mean wind, <coughs> breath, or spirit. It appears about 400 times. The common thread connecting the soul and spirit is that they're both immaterial, invisible life forces. The spirit from God. animates all of life. Watch. The spirit comes from God and returns to God, but the spirit is not unique to humans. 
In Ecclesiastes 3.19.20, we learn that animals have spirit too. They have ruach. Watch. Quote, I said in my heart, as for the sons of men, God tests them so that they may see that they themselves are like animals. Hmm. For that which happens to the sons of men happens to animals. Every one thing happens to them. As the one dies, so the other dies. Yes, they have all one breath, ruah. They all have one spirit, animals and humans. Mm -hmm. And man has no advantage over the animals for all his vanity or emptiness. All go to one place, all go upward. And the spirit, ruah, of the animal, it's interesting, whether it goes downward to the earth. The spirit, the life-giving force from God, is found in humans and animals. So the spirit alone cannot be what God means by the image and likeness of God. It is critical that we discover what that means because there lies our true identity. What connects us to Adam and Eve? It's not our physical attributes, not the blood coursing through our veins. There are others like this, I, I believe, on the planet before that. But there was something that God gave the new species, the man, remember? The protos, the prototype, the new species, the new creation was something different that made them like God and the image and likeness of God. What did they receive from God that made them like God? The answer is found in the second account of man's creation, Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The answer is found in those words, breath of God. Yahweh God formed from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath. Neheshman. Now, I want you to pay special attention to this word. Because, again, it doesn't appear in the English, and the translation, I think, is rather lacking. What is it? N E S H A N A. Uh -huh. yes. And where's the little umla? <clears throat> the first day. Where? We're above the first. Above the first. Day. The first full days. Right here. Full days. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the and the second one. And the second one. We're in the All right. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> okay. The word breath in this passage is from the Hebrew word neheshama. I may not be, again, I don't speak Hebrew, right? I don't, that's just not my language. This breath of God, the neheshama, not the spirit, ruah, not the soul, nephesh, made the man different from the animals and all of his human predecessors, all that came before this moment in time, this creation of God. The Hebrew word Neheshma holds the key to our God-likeness. So what is it? The Hebrew word for breath, Neheshama, could mean spirit, intellect, or divine inspiration. Oh, and it does carry within it, in addition to Ruach, a spirit, and intellect, or inspiration, divine inspiration. So well, that's the possible translation of that word. This is really interesting. It is an immaterial, intellectual, I want to stress that. Remember, we've gone in 7,000 years from the cave to the moon, from fire sticks to simple heating in our homes and air conditioning. It's an immaterial intellectual parts of human given to the first man and woman in the garden. They received the Heshama. They received divine intellect and inspiration through God's Spirit. Animals didn't get this. Mm -hmm. Animals have very limited thought processes. I want to answer it, but I feel like I spoil it. Isn't that consciousness? Yes. Yes, no, that, let's talk about that for a moment, because I don't know if I have it in my note. You do, it's coming up. Your puppy dog does not know it's going to die. It has a fear of being hit by a car or lightning, but it doesn't know why. 
It doesn't know it's finite. It just gets up, looks for water and food, goes out and poops somewhere and comes back home. That's, that's an animal. An animal is by instinct. Mm -hmm. Survival is the key to the animal life. And when we domesticated them, we, we removed them a little bit from that, but they're still deep within their DNA, that survival mode. Humans aren't like that. Humans are different. We're made in the image and likeness of God. We are conscious of the fact that we are not going to be here forever. At one point in time in your life, it's probably going to hit you right in the face like a Mack truck. And when it does, it will change you for the better. It will change you for the better when you realize this is not all there is. This comes to an end. It has to by design. It's built in by God. But you are made in the image and likeness of God. You were not created to come to an end. You were created to live forever. Just not in these mortal, sickly, dying bodies. You know, it's just, we're made in the image and likeness of God. We have the Neshama. We have something animals never have. I'll, I'll prove it to you. This has got to be proven, but watch. This intelligence, not the solar spirit, makes us like God and separates us from animal. The part that, of God that made them like God can be identified by their intellectual capacity. They were given divine intelligence. It's interesting in the Genesis account, but often goes unnoticed, Adam and Eve could speak. They had language capability. They could reason. God warned them about the tree and the fruit on the tree. They could reason, they could think, mm -hmm. they could think, but they chose not to, but they had intellectual capability immediately. Why? Because they possessed this part from God, that part of the breath of God, the head and the heshma. Now the breath of God, we know, gives, actually, I'll show you in a moment, gives two lives, but this is the part that makes us different from all the creation. It makes us like God. The divine inspiration intellect. It's through this consciousness that we can even think about God. We can even go back and trace our, our genealogy back to Adam and Eve. It's this that makes it possible for us to think about eternity. Animals don't think about eternity. They're thinking about the next meal. We are different. We are God-like creatures. We were created to serve God. We're created to be here on this planet to take care of it on God's behalf. We have something to do here. We're not just here to take up time and space. We are God's representatives on the planet. Jesus Christ made that crystal clear. That's why we're here. We're not here just to satisfy our own desires and drives and dreams. We're here to do something for Christ, something that will last forever. And you can. You don't have to be a preacher, an evangelist, a you know, Bible teacher. Just be a godly man or woman. You're going to touch lives. You're, you're made to do this. You're made in God's image, in God's likeness. This intelligence is an expression of something much more profound. A mind like God. The new species had a mind, consciousness, awareness. There, our predecessors did not possess this intelligence. 200,000 years at least. Some, some anthropologists think humans have been on the planet for millions of years. And barring extinction events, they never progressed to the place we are in just 7,000 years. That is, I don't know if people get, I, I, yeah. I try to stress that, that is phenomenal to think of what's happened in this very small space of time, considering the millions of years they see. They say the universe has been 13.4, 13.5 billion years old. Yeah. It's, that's amazing if it's true. I, wow. The hallmark of humankind is its intellect, the capacity to think, acquire, combine, and express knowledge. I would argue that this is evidence in many ways. The chief among them is language. Language, the ability to communicate verbally by sign, writing, is a foundational proof of intelligence. Without it, there's no progress. Huh. Think about it.
If you invent something, you can't write it down, the next person has to reinvent it. <laughs> you, you're stuck. You, you know, you're stuck rubbing wood together for fire with each generation's silly. However, while the man and woman were intelligent beings, the animals, the exception for that is the serpent. The serpent is representative of the enemy, Satan. But animals in the narrative do not exhibit any traits of human intellectual abilities. None. Why? They were not created in the image and likeness of God. And remember, the image and likeness of God is not physical, not the soul, not the spirit. All those things are shared by animals. But this is never shared by animals in the scriptures. We're going to prove that today. Yes? Do you think that the serpent is primarily allegorical? Or do you think that it is, you know, it, it, in, in the case of it is an allegory? That, the, um, do, do you think that, that could just be describing like the inner temptations that I think consciousness it's, creates? I think it's both. Okay. I think it's, it's there to represent something greater. Mm -hmm. But I actually think there was some kind of a serpent in the garden that was upright and speaking because the curse on the serpents because of this is that they have to crawl in their belly and with their tongues they have to live and, and I don't know how Moses knew this but that's exactly how snakes determine their environment Correct. by their tongue and they're eating the dust that tells them where they're at and what's around any prey or any predators how did Moses know that? that's how Moses knew that right he was made in the image and likeness of God. He had intelligence. Isn't that amazing? Many more things in the scriptures like that. I think it's both. Very good question. So, how will we like God? The spirit was given to humans. The mind was only uh, was given to humans and animals. The mind only given to humans. And understanding what Mahesh Amma is, we discover the answer to the question, how will we like God? And how are we different from animals? The man was created from the dust of the ground and the breath of God. With this, the man received two lives. Now, this is not commonly taught because it's not commonly understood. I think sometimes uh, teachers are lazy and they're repetitive. They read something, they repeat it. But you've got to dig in. You've got to do a deep dive sometimes. Though the English translation of verse 7 in Genesis 2 translates the Hebrew word for life, K or J as singular, it should have been translated as plural, i.e., that is, the man received the breath of lives. And I cite Jameson Fawcett Brown Bible commentary. And it's also in the Targum of Ankylos. The man received two lives, that is, the physical and the immaterial or mind, Ruach and Nashma, when God breathed into him. I learned this from a man 50 years ago almost, Pastor Charles Ewing. He's the one, when I attended his Bible study as a young preacher, he helped mentor me in the Word. And one of the things he taught me was how to study, to look beyond what you're hearing out there. But he told me, and he taught me, that we were given two lives. And when I researched I found out, of course, he was right. We not only received our physical life, but we received the image and likeness of God implanted in us. It's amazing. Anyway, we know the man and woman immediately possess intelligence as they communicated through language that requires intelligence. They were conscious of right and wrong that requires intelligence. They had a conscience. This breath of God, Nehesh Hama, gave the man and us a superior mind, intelligence, and consciousness. Not surprisingly, with the creation of the new species about five to 7,000 years ago, we also had the beginning of recorded history. In Genesis 7, 21-22, both Hebrew words breath and spirit, Yashima and Ruach, appear in the text. All flesh died that moved on the earth, including birds, livestock, animals, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man all on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath and heshema of the spirit of life Ruach died. He's talking about the great flood. Mm -hmm. Though the two words appear to mean the same thing, they're, they're different, significantly different. This becomes clear in Job 32.8. Quote, but there is a spirit, Ruach, in man, and the spirit, capital S, the heshema of the 
Almighty gives them understanding. Now notice, we have the spirit, which animates us like animals, but we have the heshma, which gives us understanding, mm -hmm. intellect, consciousness. We're different than animals. Don't, don't let people fool you. We're made in the image and of God. You see that person out there that's all dressed up and doing drugs and got face stuff on or they're living like, you know, the bums and hobos? They're made in the image and likeness of God, too. But most of them don't have a clue. They don't look in the mirror of the Word. And some who do look in the Word, when they leave the Word, they forget who and what they are. Amazing. Remember, whenever the two words Ruach, Spirit, and Hashemah appear together, they always refer to God or humans. Never animals. As an example, in Isaiah 42, 5, Thus saith God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it, He that giveth breath, the Heshema, unto the people upon it, and spirit, Ruach, to them that walk therein. Spirit is the animation of life, and Heshema is the intellect, the divine intellect from God. We can... We can imagine stuff and create it. And what's the hallmark of God? He's a creator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look in the mirror. You want to see the best thing, the best work He's ever created? Yeah. Look in the mirror. Yeah. You're looking at it. You, me. I, I went to God. Everybody knew who they were in Christ today. Yeah. We wouldn't live like we do. Would step up as agents, representatives of the great God, and behave properly and take care of this planet and one another in a proper way. Stop the wars, stop all the nonsense, the hatred, the divisiveness that's beneath us as those who've been made in the image and likeness of God. We don't need to participate in that stuff. The psalmist David wrote, for I will not contend forever, neither will I always be angered or wroth. For the spirit, Ruah, should fall be, fail before me, and the souls, the Heshma, which I have made. He's talking about God making us. The psalmist David was correct. God gave humankind the Heshma, the intelligence we possess. Isaiah 57, 16, in King James Version, is an English translation where the Heshma is translated as souls. That's incorrect. I put that in there so you would know. The correct Hebrew word for souls is nephesh. We read that earlier. Not the Heshema. The spirit gives us life, while the Heshema gives us consciousness and intellect. Notably, the Heshema makes us like God. Being made in God's image and likeness and possessing intellect gives humans divine prerogatives. Mm -hmm. These prerogatives are the things that distinguish humans from animals. Animals don't have these abilities. These are divine prerogatives, only given to us. Among them are intellect, language, dominion, inspiration, imagination, creativity, morals, ethics. The divine intellect also makes it possible for us to become aware of life's spiritual dimension and connect with our Creator. Dogs don't pray. Not that I know. And if they did, they're probably praying for the next meal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have an intuitive drive. I've never met a human, even those who are atheists or agnostic, who didn't have a little something inside of them that wanted to know, maybe I'm wrong. They wanted to know. Because it's this intuitive thing that connects us to our Creator. Mm -hmm. We may not know consciously what it is, but in the Scriptures, it's revealed. We're made in the image and likeness of God. The psalmist David understood this when he wrote, "Let everything that has breath, the Hashem, praise God. Without divine intellect, we would be like animals. And there's an odd event in biblical history that supports this belief. I'm going to read it to you. I don't think it's in your notes. Is King Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah. So oh, good. All right, here's the, here's the story. The prophet Daniel interpreted a dream King Nebuchadnezzar had. He had this odd dream, and he called all of his soothsayers and magicians in, and he said to them, if you can tell me the interpretation of this dream, 
you know, I'm going to reward you greatly. None of them could do it. Well, Daniel shows up, this Jewish boy, and he knows the interpretation of the dream. Nebuchadnezzar said, I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts of my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore I made a decree to bring all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. This must have been some crazy dream for the king to call these wise people together, just to interpret the dream. I don't know about you, but most of my dreams are crazy, and I can't remember them except when I'm in the middle of the dream. Very rare when I remember a dream, but he remembered this one. Though he, the king asked Babylon's wise men to interpret it for him, they could not. One man, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, knew the interpretation. Daniel told the king, this is the interpretation of the king, and it is the decree of the Most High, which has come on my lord the king. You will be driven from men, and your dwelling shall be with the animals of the field. You'll be made to eat grass as oxen, and you'll be wet with the dew of the sky, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he will. So seven years are going to pass. He's going to live like what? An animal. An animal. He's going to be out among the dew, the grass. He's going to eat like an animal. He's going to behave like an animal. A year later, the events Daniel predicted began to unfold. A, quote, voice from the sky, and quote, repeated Daniel's words to the king. He would be driven from men and dwell among the animals. He would eat grass like an ox until he knew, quote, the most high rules in the kingdom of men and give it to whom wherever he will. End quote. So apparently, the king Nebuchadnezzar had a, uh, too high of an opinion of himself. Probably thought he was God. A lot of potentates in years gone by, in fact, thought they were divine beings. The pharaohs did. It is noteworthy that Nebuchadnezzar behaved like an animal until something unusual happened. Here's the quote. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him who lives forever. Verse 34. Notice the word I highlighted in the passage, understanding. In Hebrew, it is manda, which means wisdom or intelligence. The same thing occurs in verse 36. Quote, at the same time, my reason, manda, returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. This recap. The king became like an animal when he lost his reason, his understanding, his intellect. When he lost that, he became like an animal. Oh. Animals don't have this. We do. It's making a, it makes us like God. The king became like an animal when he lost his reason or understanding. When his reason and understanding returned, he became human once again. The story illustrates the difference between humans and animals. Humans have divine intellect, while animals have a soul and spirit. They do not have Maheshma, divine intellect. The writer Job also understood this when he wrote, but there is a spirit, Ruah, in a man, and the inspiration, the Heshma of the Almighty, giveth them understanding. Job 32, 8, that's the King James Version. In this passage, Job confirms my belief that the inspiration of the Almighty, quote, unquote, or the breath, Maheshma, gives man understanding, or mind, intelligence. Consciousness. The mind has five functions. Well, let me stop for a moment. Do you have any questions or comments at this point? Crazy story about King Nebuchadnezzar. But if he's an animal, <coughs> then how can he have intellect at that point? No, he became like an animal. God punished him, if you will. Okay. Turns, takes his intellect from him somehow. He lost his ability to reason, to think. When his understanding returned, he became like a human again. He stopped eating grass and living with the oxen. Okay. 
This shows us the point of that is that without our intelligence, our Naheshma, Manda, understanding, we're just like animals. That's what makes us unlike animals and makes us more importantly like God. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the most wonderful things when we grasp this gift, God, this gift, God, this and the creation to be able to love, to be loved, to care for people, care for your pets, just to, to be God-like comes from our Creator. It's in our, gen, our DNA from God. It's in our genetics. You have to re really do something in your life to overcome it. You have, you have to deny God somehow. Fight against it, if you will. Because it's in there. Most people, I really think, most people want to be godly. But this world is just full of insanity today. Mm -hmm. And, and the word, a lot of the pulpits say it's entertainment. It's a 60 minute thing. I had somebody tell me, <coughs> I posted some things online. He said, Oh, you, really, you need to cut it down to 15 minutes. Well, if, all you, if your attention span for things I've got is 15 minutes, don't turn me on. Because I, I, you know, I, I put out some shorter things for people, it doesn't matter. I, Chris, I'm always complaining my life, Chris. I turn on YouTube, and there's a, a YouTube video of a guy fixing a broken sink. He's got two million views. Check me out. A million three, two million. The lock picking lawyer has a four or five million subscribers. Teach how to pick a lock. I put up something that might change your life. Forty views. <laughs> Forty views. And people are yawning. You know, oh, geez, fifteen. He's going twenty-five minutes. What's wrong with him? Well, if your attention span is 15 minutes, you've got the attention span of a gnat when it comes to spiritual things. If you want to change your life, pay attention. For God's sake, start paying attention to something that may, can make a difference in your life. That's a, your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's, that's understanding the scriptures. Not just reading them, understanding them, how they affect your life today. It'll transform your life. You want a good life? Find Christ, follow Christ. Really? But stay away from those, I call them crazy churches today. They're just, they're not teaching you anything. Mm -hmm. They're entertaining you and taking your money. The mind has five functions. To will. <clears throat> it's in the mind where the intellect resides. It's in the mind where you choose how you want to live your life. Mm -hmm. That's it's very important. It's where you make your decisions. And unfortunately today, when it comes to decision making, young people are not being taught consequential thinking. Correct. You know what consequential thinking is? If I do this, that's going to happen. Real simple. They're not taught critical thinking. That's missing today. They're not taught how to think at all, young people. I feel bad for them. They're heading into a life that demands consequential thinking and critical thinking. It demands wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is what to do. Wisdom is how to do it. You know, there are times when, in knowledge, you know somebody's shooting their mouth off and you want to correct them publicly, but wisdom says, no, don't do that. You, know? you want to get both knowledge and wisdom as you grow, and that's in the scriptures. I told you, in the future, we're going to go through Proverbs, uh, the, the wisdom books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. We want to go through those books, and in there you're going to find truths that never grow old mm -hmm. for human life, for the blessings of having a good life. Anyway, it's where we will to do something, we choose. It has conscience. Remember the conscience has only two functions, mm -hmm. to approve our behavior or condemn it. But interestingly about the conscience, <laughs> your conscience has only two functions,
functions to approve, right? Mm -hmm. Or condemn. Was it right? Now, what is your conscience going to use to prove something or condemn it? Judgment. Huh? Judgment. Your intellect. Morals. All of you are kind of, you're right there. You're right there. Your beliefs. Mm -hmm. It's your beliefs. If, you, if your mind, you mind if I do a little segue here? Mm -hmm. Go for it. If your mind, let's think of your mind as a grid. This is what I used to use. This is your mind, okay? And then somewhere in there, you think stealing is wrong. Now, just for the record, there are people who don't think stealing is wrong. They're called criminals. <laughs> okay? So, but you think stealing is wrong. They don't think stealing is wrong. So here is your belief. This is your belief. Right there. So, when you act on that belief, if you act in accordance with it, you're going to feel good. Right? Mm -hmm. Because you haven't violated the belief. Right. You've acted in accordance with your belief. The criminal comes along and the criminal says, I believe stealing is okay. So when they steal something, how are they going to feel? Good. They're going to feel good. It's not what you do or feel, it's what you believe. That's going to make the difference in how you feel. It's going to make the difference in how you yeah. grow in life and whether you prosper properly or not. That's why it's critical for us to work on this part. This part has to do with the image and likeness of God. The mind, the consciousness, the divine intellect. The belief system that God put within us, the possibility to know something and to act on it that's godly, comes from the Word of God. That's why you need to understand the wisdom books. It's critical. You need to understand the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Critical. He not only taught stuff, he lived it. He was so con committed to what he believed, he died for it. So acting on what you believe produces the feeling, but what you believe it determines whether or not you feel good because it's godly or not. The criminal feels fine when they steal. We think, well, why do they do It's what they believe. Hmm. We have to get great beliefs in this wonderful thing God has given us, the image and likeness of God. We needn't corrupt it with false beliefs, ungodly beliefs, harmful beliefs. We need to protect this image and likeness of God and build with that mind that's going to provide you with a wonderful life. Do you have any idea how wonderful this experience is? Being here on the planet? You know, we're flying out the way. Yeah. yeah this, is, this is incredible. To have life, to be loved, to love, to have family. It doesn't get any better. It's all made possible. But protect your mind. Jesus said, for out of it flow the issues of life and death. So Jesus taught us, it's in mind. Don't let people get into your head hmm. and tell you things that are ungodly. Don't let them get in your head and convince you of something that's ungodly or wrong. Don't do it. Because this and this are all dependent upon this, the mind. Now, back to consequential thinking, critical thinking. We have to learn how to do that. Consequential thinking is kind of like trying to look around the corner and see the future. And the more experience you have in the past gives you a greater view of the possibilities of the future. The older you get, the smarter you get, the better your life's going to get. If you're practicing things God is teaching us. Memory. I don't know if I want to talk too much about memory. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I don't know if you get up here. I'm not sure I can get into that and be convincing. Uh, <laughs> you know what's wonderful about this part of our image and likeness of God? It not only 
remember, remember an event, we can remember the feeling many times if it was a major event. Sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. Some of the things I think about, I cry. Just thought of one of them. Because the memory is so present, so real, so alive. I tell my grandkids when I'm dead and gone, every time you mention my name, I'll come back to life. You tell your kids, oh, Grandpa Baloo said blah, 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 or I hated it when Grandpa Baloo did blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and every time you say that, oh, Grandma, you bring me back to life. That's a memory. It carries with it not only the moment, but the feeling. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wonderful? What a gift. What a gift. Emotions, affections. Now we know animals share some emotions. Mm -hmm. We know that. We've seen that in some of the studies with the you know, apes and chimpanzees and so forth. But it's not the same. Ours are lifelong. Ours are deeper, more meaningful. Creation, imagination. Wow. Think, think about that. What kind of a world have we created today? I love it. I really do love it, to be able to have this technology and be able to FaceTime one of my family members and laugh together, and even though we're hundreds of miles apart. It's the next best thing. Mm -hmm. And some human who has the divine intellect and was inspired thought of it, and then they created it, and somebody improved on it, and then it got better and better. You know? I mean, you guys have never sat before a television that was this big, grainy, and the council came and it was this big. <laughs> yeah, it was black and white. It was black and white, yeah. Yeah, I tell, I'm trying to tell the grandkids, when I was a kid, I walked to school uphill both ways. <laughs> when I was a kid, we had channels 2, 4, 7, and 9, and when they came out with ultra high frequency, UHF, we got channel 62 or whatever in Detroit. We were, oh, God, holy. We got another channel. Yeah. <laughs> Today yeah, we have deal. thousands of channels. All around the world. All, oh, yes. You can. You, you have yeah, a you don't have to get up and turn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I can sit there with the remote. <laughs> and they didn't last all night either. Yeah. Like midnight, the TV shut off. Oh, yeah, in the old days, midnight went to a screen and it had a little beep. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> Yeah, so he's looked at me like, what? You're crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. it has it showed the, the, the yeah. American flag. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was one. Yeah, that's true. There's a there, and then the one with the... Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Party over. Except shock. From oh, gosh, why did this do this? 62. Yeah, that was well, back in the early days. I know. Right. John 4, 23, through the Spirit, I skipped the portion here, but through the Spirit we can pray and worship to God. But the hour comes and now is when the true believers will worship this, will worship the Father in spirit and truth, who the Father seeks such to be his worshipers. Mm -hmm. And worshiping is not just going to church, folks. Mm -hmm. We worship God in how we live our lives. Our, our lives should be open testament to the work of God in our lives. People may not know that you're following Christ, but they, they should be able to say, geez, there's something different about that. Yes. Or they're really nice people, loving, generous, caring people. Hmm. You know, we should perplex the world with our Christ likeness, if you will. Yeah. We worship God. I, I worship God in prayer. I worship God. I sing. Sometimes I sing in tongues. You know, I'm, I'm driving down the road listening to Andre Crouch or whatever. Man, I'm just overwhelmed by the presence of God. I just start praising God for all the goodness in my life. You guys are part of that goodness in my life. Yeah. It's amazing. Anyhow, Romans 8, 15, For you didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by, by whom we cry, Abba, our Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. You say, well, I thought it was children of God and Eve. Yeah, but you can go one step farther. Uh -huh. We're children of God. That's where that 
mine came from, yeah. didn't come from Adam and Eve, it came through them <coughs> to us. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. The physical body, we're almost done. Can you give me five more minutes? Mm -hmm. The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. The body should be under the control of the spirit and soul. It is a never-ending task to keep proper control. The Bible says in Galatians 5, 16, 17, But I say, walk by the spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, that you might not do the things that you desire. In other words, the body, how do you, how do you explain it? The body has desires. You know, they're thick. Well, let's, let's talk about what the atomies want. No, not sex. Eating. How's that? That's a desire. Mm -hmm. You only have to think about it. You just get hungry and you start foraging. When the when the boys come over, all three of the boys, and they come over, the first thing they do is go to the refrigerator and they go to the cereal. <laughs> <laughs> the grandma jar. Yeah, the grandma jar. And I go, when they leave, I say to Christine, didn't we have some string cheese here? Where did the string cheese go? She's, oh, Brett got that. <laughs> <laughs> what about the cereal? Well, James and Nathan. They got that. Jeez, the milk's gone. Yeah, well, that's, that's gone too. Yeah. But their, the bodily desires chief among them is the sex drive. <clears throat> Young people need to have an open, honest, fruitful discussion about sex. That's where the book of Song of Solomon comes in. When we study that, I don't know if we can study it. It's, it's pretty graphic. But it's a wonderful book. God, God inspired it. But young people need to know the pitfalls mm -hmm. of sex, as well as the blessings of it. It's a wonderful gift from God. Don't don't let anybody tell you sex is not a wonderful thing. It is wonderful, and it doesn't change when you get old. It doesn't. You just slower. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't change. But it has to be controlled. By Mahesha, the divine intellect God gave you, has to be controlled by consequential thinking, critical thinking. Don't let your sexual appetites draw you away from the things of God because you have to pay a penalty. Eventually you pay a penalty. That's the way it works. The physical body. Watch and pray that you do not enter in temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26, 41. Uh -huh. That's a commentary on the reality of human beings. We don't want to do that, but eh, why not? <laughs> you know, God, I don't think I should be doing this. Oh, what the heck? I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. Remember, the mind has will, volition. Mm -hmm. That's where you have that fight. And then mm -hmm. the consciousness comes in. Your conscience, what you believe. Mm -hmm. I'm not beyond that. I'm an old man. But I'm not beyond this battle. It's lifelong, never ending. You see other people doing crazy things. You say, Pete, I've never done that. Why? Well, because it's ungodly for, not, for one thing. Yeah, but they're having so much fun. Yeah, but it's ungodly for one thing. <laughs> Don't do it. Consequential thinking. Following Jesus means to take up your cross daily and die to the desires of the flesh and mind. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. God wants us to understand these things. God wants us to have a fruitful life, an enjoyable life. Yes. But he wants us to have it in such a way that it's not harmful in the long run, not hurtful in the long run. He wants you to have the benefits as well as the joys. And, and I'm telling you, with Christ, all, this, all that lies to, within your grasp. You can have it all. Here you can. All right, any questions before we wrap it up?